All right, what's up, guys? Here we go. We made it. We're at episode 10 of my brand new podcast, All Access, the photography podcast about urban exploring. Today, finally, we have a very special episode that I've been talking about since episode one. We have a lawyer who specializes in criminal law who's going to help us maybe navigate some of the things that we need to know. Her name is Megan Smith, and she runs a law office out of Burlington, Ontario, called M. Smith Law, msmithlaw.ca. Yes, I know her because she helped me get out of a pickle in 2020 when a homeowner wanted to press charges against me for entering uh, her abandoned property. So we're going to talk to Megan. We're going to learn some things. I'm going to tell you guys my story about what happened and how I resolved it. Maybe you guys can use this information to help resolve your own issues if you need. So let's get right to it, guys. Episode 10 of All Access, a photography podcast with Megan Smith-Lock. Let's go. Anything before we start that you wanted to uh Yeah, so say? I just like to obviously uh just confirm that any information that we discuss uh is not to be construed as legal advice to anybody listening. Um I have you know, I'm not acting for anybody that is uh interested at this point. They're help- welcome to reach out to me, but um, any information that we discuss is strictly legal information. It's not legal advice. Perfect. Very well said. Yeah. I could not have said it better myself. <laughs> Okay, so guys, welcome to episode 10 of my podcast, which is called All Access, the Freetography Podcast. Today we have a very special episode. We are meeting with a criminal lawyer, and she's going to talk to us a little bit about trespassing. And uh, we're going to go through a bit of a history of she and I, because she helped me get out of a pickle a couple of years ago. But let's just get right to it, because she's very busy. Guys, this is (laughs) Megan Smith of msmithlaw.ca. I got that right? That's correct. Yep. (laughs) Good. Why don't you tell us a little bit about you and uh, who you are and what you do? Yeah, absolutely. So um, as you indicated, my name is Megan Smith. I practice criminal defense. Uh, I'm not a criminal lawyer in the sense that I'm not a criminal, but uh, we always like to make that joke. But um, (laughs) maybe only criminal lawyers think it's funny, probably. But uh, (laughs) I also practice family law, uh, child protection, dealing with the Children's Aid Society, Uh, My background's in social work, so um, prior to becoming a lawyer, I had my bachelor in social work, and when I was at school um, at the University of Windsor, I did my master's in social work while I was in law school. So uh, my practice focuses a lot on the overlap between criminal and family law, uh, whether that's because of family violence um, or allegations of family violence, that sort of thing, but uh, I also branch out and and deal with uh, all types of criminal matters, whether that be related to unlawfully in a dwelling allegations. Uh, (laughs) I've dealt with uh, mischief, all sorts of different types of uh, criminal uh, allegations. And also, as I mentioned, family law and and how that can overlap at times as well. So great. So I'll say it again. It's uh, her website is msmithlaw.ca. If you have any uh, needs, uh, that relate to anything that Megan just said. So we'll get to the meat and potatoes of why we're here. Uh, So in the fall of 2019, I was off on a road trip throughout the back roads of Ontario, and I found a pretty interesting looking abandoned property. I pulled my car up into the driveway, walked around and checked, and uh, sure enough, I I could definitely verify that this was abandoned and I could get in very easily without causing any damage. Did my thing, took my pictures, I posted a video, Uh, This was, again, in the fall of 2019, and then in the summer of 2020, I was served with a summons in the mail Um, I was being charged, and I had no idea what location, where it was coming from. All I knew was that I was getting charged, so I I panicked a little bit. I'm like, I mean, I always knew this was coming (laughs) eventually, but as did my wife. So I reached out to a a former colleague at Haber Lawyers in Burlington, and they said that they don't represent uh, uh, criminal law. So they said, uh, get in touch with Megan, which I did. And uh, so that's how you and I ended up meeting. So now I will preface this by saying I did give Megan permission to talk about the details of my situation. So she's not breaking any confidentiality uh, or anything like that. So she's good to talk about whatever she wants on our situation. So um why don't you start by telling us a little bit about what you remember of, of my situation that I was in and how we resolved it? Yeah, absolutely. So um, oftentimes in, in similar situations, people reach out to me and say, 
Um, you know, I've been charged. Often they have a better idea of why. <laughs> um, <laughs> usually they're often arrested uh, near the time of the alleged offense. Um, so they have a better sense of what they're accused of. But often it's actually surprisingly common for people to not understand what they're accused of doing um, and to have no idea what what crime um, they may be dealing with. So uh, in your situation, I remember you said, I, I have, I don't know what, like, why would I be getting charged with, with something like this? Um, and then of course we have to write to the crown, ask for the disclosure, which is the crown's case against you, whether that's police notes, any surveillance from any properties. Um, and so once we get that, we can take a look and see if, is there anything missing? There might be some police note. Often it's, you know, there's, there's stuff missing, but I remember from your case, we discussed um, what the allegations were, and you were a bit surprised that it was this family um, that was raising concerns. And I think also what had happened is that, from what I remember, there was uh, some allegations that there were some items missing. Yes. And you said, well, I don't, do, I don't take stuff. I, yeah. That's one of, you know, you have your own, I remember you had your own uh, kind of a code of conduct in yeah. exploring these abandoned properties. And one of them is to not take anything that doesn't belong to you. And you might even try to connect with someone that you, if you can find the owner of the home, I think you mentioned that if you find things of value, you say, Hey, like this a property is really easy to access. Like maybe you should come and uh, sort things out, that sort of thing. Yeah. So uh, I do remember that side of it. And I did connect with the crown and it was in a more, more rural area of Ontario. So it's mm -hmm. kind of, it's, diff it's different in each area that you deal with. Some people think like, well, criminal law, and it should be standard across the country, really. It's federal uh, legislation, the Criminal Code of Canada. But in each, in each province, um, the provincial crowns are the ones designated to deal with the file. And then even within different regions, different crowns take different approaches. Right. So I connected with a crown attorney and... We discussed what we normally do at what's called the Crown pre-trial, is that we would discuss whether there's any potential to resolve the issue without having to schedule a trial, and whether there's any possibility and what the issues would be if you do go to trial. And I don't have to really give up anything because I'm defense counsel. It's the Crown's obligation to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that you've committed the essential elements of this crime beyond a reasonable doubt, which is mm -hmm. a high standard of proof. So... Uh, and, and to an extent, you do have to put forward a defense at the trial stage, but I don't have to tell the Crown what it is that's going to be our defense. But that being said, obviously, there's risks involved with proceeding to trial, including they may ask for a harsher penalty if a, if a judge decides that you are guilty of the, uh, the alleged offense. So uh, in my approach, generally, is to see how can we try to avoid the risk of that, if possible, uh, and in your circumstance, we were able, actually, I think it was your suggestion, Dave, that you came up and said, what if I try to make like this, how this, this, how, this person that uh, owns this property may need some assistance cleaning it up. And if I'm willing to go out there and help her sort through the belongings, um, then maybe that's a good, like restorative justice approach. So we did an informal diversion where you had gone out a few times to the property helped her clean it up. And, uh, and as a result, the crown was willing to withdraw the charges saying there's no public interest in, in pursuing this as a, as a crime, um, because you had done the upfront work, you had no criminal record, you had no, you know, there's, there's no value to you having a criminal record that could, uh, influence your ability to travel or get employment and those kinds of things. So yeah. that, that was a reasonable approach. Um, I do remember that it being a bit frustrating because oftentimes um, people compare themselves to others too. And I remember you said, like saying that, you know, there's people that actually went and stole from this woman that are having, facing no consequences. So it's yeah. frustrating, but unfortunately you can only deal with kind of like what you're, the hand you're dealt and uh, try to get a resolution around that. I mean, the other option if would, would could have been to schedule a trial Obviously, there's more um, time involved in that. And so it's an added expense for, for mm -hmm. a lot of people. Uh, most people don't qualify for legal aid. You have in order to qualify for legal aid. Um, there's some pretty strict criteria. You basically can't have a very high income at all. And they have to be seeking jail time. So 
a lot, I would say the majority of people that are dealing with the criminal justice system don't qualify for legal aid. Um, they can get assistance from duty counsel, which is a little bit different. It's offered through legal aid, but that's just to help you through each court appearance. And even then there's some financial eligibility that's pretty strict. So uh, in, in a lot of people's circumstances, they also have to factor in the cost and right. the amount of time and also having the, the charges go on and having that uncertainty. And often there's release conditions imposed. Um, I'm not, I can't, to be honest, I can't recall whether they were too strict for you as far as, I don't think you had any conditions uh, imposed on you around what, what you could or couldn't do. If we, so for I some did, people, I believe it's, you told me, uh, you would have advised me to stop exploring and stop trespassing <laughs> <laughs> uh, while this is mm -hmm. going on. And what I did at the time was I started going to waterfalls. A lot, a lot of people would have noticed that I stopped posting abandoned <laughs> content and I started going to waterfalls all over Ontario <laughs> in the meantime to keep me busy. So I'll back up a little bit and into what happened was, you know, like what ended up happening was the woman who owned this home had a trail camera set up. So when I pulled my car up to the property to take a look around, she got my license plate on the trail cam. And she also got, I, then I pulled away and I parked up the street and I, I walked up the driveway and she got me on the camera holding my little film video camera. Then she had my YouTube video of me walking into the property holding yeah. that camera. So she had me. Um, but yeah, you, you mentioned the frustration because there were, she, she told me when we met, she has footage of a couple of girls stealing furniture out of her house on her trail cam. She knows who they are. She knows their names. She put forward a complaint to the local police department and nothing ever came of it. And that's where I was like, I literally walked in, walked out empty handed. <laughs> and I was the one that got charged. It was so frustrating. Um, but so can you tell us a little bit, because now there's, there's trespassing, there's breaking and entering. And what I was charged with was, maybe you can explain that, what I was actually charged with. Yeah, so it was unlawfully in a dwelling. Um, right. So there's different essential elements of each offense that the Crown has to prove. And I don't want to get too into too much technical detail of each criminal offense. And, of course. Um, you know, that's more for a criminal law class. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but essentially, in each offense, the Crown has the obligation to to prove that you had committed those offenses. So when we, you and I had talked about what is a dwelling, if no one's dwelling in the home, what does that mean? What does that look like? And the thing is that it, whether it's the police, like there's a lot of people that have discretion in this system. So the, first of all, the police have the discretion to determine whether they think there's reasonable and probable grounds to arrest you. And then moving for, if the police find can can make that nexus, then it moves on to the Crown Attorney's Office and they become responsible for determining whether this is worth pursuing to a trial. And if they do, and in your case, they determined, like, given the work that you were doing up front and the fact that the, the complainant was satisfied with the outcome as well from your perspective, um, they decide it's not worth, obviously, pursuing further. And then, but if it had to, if it had to go to a trial, then the judge is the one that has the discretion and uh, some of the there, there's different case law where they say, OK, well, if it's an abandoned house, is that sufficient under that that section of the act? And there's some legislation or there's some cases that say, well, how recently was it abandoned? And, you know, and some places that might appear abandoned, they might still have people living there. Right. So and I think it's also an aggravating factor that it's somebody's home. So it's different. Um, you know, the legislation also addresses when dealing with break and enters, for example, it's far more aggravating to break into somebody's residence. Um, and uh, there's much more significant penalties involved with, with the residential break in, especially if someone is home uh, and if they're confronted, if there's obviously violence involved in, of any sort. Uh, and so there's a myriad of factors that can, that can come into play in kind of these situations that come up or whether there's alleged violence, right? Because somebody could say, oh, well, they came in and they had a, an ax in their hand. And people, the interesting psychology that comes into place is people's memories that <laughs> when you're in a state of shock, how do you, how do you act? Are you, are eyewitnesses reliable and, and all that sort yeah. of thing? So again, we could go into the academic psychology side of this as well, <laughs> which is 
I find fascinating, but is not mm-hmm. that interesting for everybody. So what, in your opinion, if you can answer this, what, in your opinion, would have been my, uh, the consequence for me had we not won and, and got this cleared off? Yeah, so I think the Crown probably in your circumstances was going to be looking for probation um, because you didn't have a record. Those are some of the factors that come into play. Um, if you had have been, although they, they actually, when looking at the trespass side of it, they do look at the fact that I, I believe you did have tickets for trespassing. So they were saying, yeah. oh, well, he's a, you're not a criminal offender, but you keep doing this stuff. And they've, you've been asked to stop around the province yeah um and you keep doing it anyway so that (laughs) that is somewhat of an aggravating factor is that um you know if even though it might not be a criminal the same thing come like i'll use the analogy of a driving offense right so if you're charged with impaired driving which is a criminal offense and you don't have a criminal record they might still look and say yeah but this person's been charged with stunt driving or you know, other highway traffic act offenses, if you have a really terrible driving record. Actually, I came across this in bail court recently when the, the accused um, had other charges that were outstanding in other jurisdictions as well. Like that will mm-hmm. factor into whether you get bail, whether you even can be released pending the charges. So in your circumstances, obviously, you weren't accused of, I don't believe you might have been accused. I don't think you were accused of stealing anything. I think that no. I don't think that was the issue. No. Um, it was just the 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 fact of not being allowed to be in that in that residence, and, and I think the, and I, the complainant was upset. She thought I broke upset. the lock. Broke the lock. Um, because right. somebody and, brought, somebody prior to me kicked the door in, and, and I think the complainant was also embarrassed. Yeah. yeah, right. I think there's an element of like there's the the crown there there, there is enshrined kind of like victims' rights. Yeah, um, and the crown policy manual. And I'm, I've never been a crown and I don't know the policy manual. I'm not going to pretend that I know it in and out because um, it's just not, not my approach. But yeah. um, it is relevant to know sometimes when you're defense counsel, though, there's certainly times where it's good to know what uh, what position they may take or that sort of thing or how they may behave in certain circumstances. But um, as far as dealing with complainants, the crown has to take into to account their feedback. If, if she said, Oh, I don't care. This never would have become a crime. And this, you know, you never would have been accused of a crime if she didn't care. Right. Um, and I think probably seeing the video, she may have been embarrassed or upset or felt like her privacy was violated as well. Mm-hmm. And those will all factor into how the crown wants to deal with it as a criminal offense. Right. And yeah. if, if, and the fact that you were able to kind of build actually a, positive relationship with her by the end of it because you're a really cool guy and she thought that was <laughs> you know really sweet of you and yeah. it was it was very generous to offer all of that time um you know that that influenced the outcome for you significantly versus people that you know if they're in a if they're in somewhere that they're not supposed to be and they destroy property or they um become obviously if they become violent that's that can become its own so they can, if you can, there's, it's very possible to be charged with more than one crime, yeah. Right, yeah. and uh, oftentimes police will charge with anything that can possibly convict you of potentially not the police convict you of, but the crown. Yeah. Um. To, uh, you know, show that you can't behave that way. So, mm-hmm. so those are some of the the factors that come into play as well. There's so there's so many different things. It'll also take into consideration your background, your cultural background. Um, if, if you have a background, if you're first nations, Métis, Inuit, if you identify as indigenous, that will, Mm -hmm. then the court is obligated to consider glad, what we call glad do factors in sentencing, um, if you're convicted. And, and so there's, there's all sorts of, uh, types of things that can come up. And and the fact that you've made it this long in your life and had no criminal implications is also going to be a huge factor too. So, right. So for the listeners, what I what I had ended up suggesting here was um, Megan and I spoke and I said, you know, like like you mentioned, I said, what if I just go there and hang out with her for, you know, however many weekends and spend a Saturday cleaning. And so between you and the crown, you determined an amount of hours. I guess you would call it a community service, basically, um, Mm -hmm. where I would drive to the location, which was a couple hours away, um, spend about. I think it was three hours per Saturday for six Saturdays in a row. 
uh, pending availability from her and me as well. I also offered to pay for the broken lock. Even though I did not break it, I said, I'll pay for it. Let's just get that out of the way. I'll take care of that. So I gave her money for the broken lock. Um, I went up and then after five Saturdays, I had asked you, you know, I know that we didn't include driving into the equation of the amount of hours needed, but I'm, I'm driving three hours, four hours every weekend <laughs> to do this. Do you think we can take off one of these Saturdays? And you talk to the crown, talk to the lady. We, they all agreed. So I managed to do five Saturdays of um, basically I helped her clean up the property inside and outside. And then she was selling things on marketplace. So she would sell the ceiling, the tins off the roof. She was selling barn boards, helped her do a little bit of demolition of a barn. Really, really nice lady. And I learned a lot about um, what it's like on the other side, on the homeowner's side. I've actually invited her to be on the podcast. I haven't heard back from her yet. Um, so what, what's interesting about this is that it could have gone, you know, I could have just been given a trespassing fine. I could have been charged with breaking and entering. Like there's so much that I didn't know coming into this that I could have potentially, I could have been charged with mischief, I'm sure, right? Like mm -hmm. there probably mm -hmm. is a whole number of charges that I, yeah. that I was, could have been faced with just for going in and taking pictures of somebody's abandoned property. And it was a, a huge lesson. I don't know if I learned my lesson, but it was a huge lesson to learn. Um, but we're going to move on from my case. So Megan, as a criminal lawyer, uh, or a, a lawyer in criminal law, <laughs> how serious and risky do you see urban exploration as it pertains to the law? Right. And the other thing that the other kind of disclaimer I want to add, in addition to saying, I'm, you know, I'm not giving anyone legal advice, is I'm also, we're talking, we're focusing on the criminal side of it. So I'm not an expert in the provincial offenses side, where, and that's under the Trespass Act. Um, that's not something that I deal a whole lot with in my practice. And I also don't deal with the civil side of it because there could be in implications for insurance. There could like, and there could be implications for civil lawsuits, small claims, if you damage items, if there's, you know, uh, you know, anything that goes missing or that sort of thing. Um, that That's another option that people have legally to pursue that I'm, I couldn't really comment on in detail, but as far as the risks involved with the criminal side of it, um, as as indicated in kind of your outcome and your circumstances, that was on the very low threshold of serious criminal offense, right? That we're we're talking. It's still, but even that, I'm sure, Dave, for you, you can speak to this too. Is that that's a very stressful situation to be accused of a crime? Like it was and for someone who's gone their whole life um, to kind of feel like you're labeled as this accused person. Um, it's very, very stressful for people. I see that in the, the clients that I advocate for. Um, and I don't tend to do, uh, you know, to, I'm not a heavy, hardcore, like criminal defense lawyer that deals with the generally deals with the more serious. I kind of leave those to my colleagues that are more experienced to deal with, um, things like home invasions as well. Right. Or when there's violence used, when there's firearms involved, so, I mean, we can be looking at anything from what yours, how we dealt with the resolution of your matter would be referred to as diversion, right? Like it was an informal diversion. The charges were ultimately just withdrawn. No criminal record. There's a there's a record in the sense of a police report. The, the courts will have records of what, what I said at each court appearance about what, what the status was. The Crown would have said there's no, um, you know, they may have even said there's no reasonable prospect of conviction because they had some weaknesses in their case too. And the fact that, you know, the law is not as black and white as people think the lawyer answer is always, it depends. So it can range in severity from having it diverted and you have no criminal record. When we had a great outcome that way, you didn't even have to schedule a trial. It's put in like, you can cost you money to, to, retain counsel. If you have to do it yourself, it can be incredibly stressful yeah. and uh, incredibly dangerous to represent yourself. Um, and then the other side of it is like, you can have anything from a diverted, you can end up, let's say if you just came to me and said, Megan, I don't, I don't want to deal with this lady. I know I shouldn't have been there. I just want to plead guilty and get this over with. And some people say that to me in my practice and it makes me cringe and I hate it, but they just want to move on. And they'll take the resolution that the Crown's offering. So it could be a conditional discharge, which if you have no record means that, um, and you can, there's lots of resources online that I can provide you some links to as well. So that if people are interested in learning more about 
um, that. Um, but as far as sentence options, there's a, a conditional discharge, which is easier to get off of your record. Uh, and then moving up the ladder is a suspended sentence. For you at the end of the day, let's say it's 12 months probation, that's going to look like 12 months probation no matter what. And then there could be different terms of probation. You could, may have to report to your probation officer. Your probation officer may require you to do counseling or some educational sessions. Um, the uh, You may, if there's, for example, in situations where violence is involved, the Crown will certainly be seeking a DNA order, which means they take a sample of your DNA and you go on the DNA data bank. If there's weapons involved, there would be a weapons prohibition. Um, and the other thing, and, and maybe you've come across this as well, is if people steal firearms, right? Like I'm sure there's some of these abandoned rural properties that may have firearms. That's yep. very, very serious. Yeah. Um, anything firearm related is extremely serious and you're generally going to be looking at jail time. So the, there's a huge spectrum of potential consequences. Um, and you can be looking at some significant jail time if there's these more serious elements involved, such as, you know, violence. Uh, if you're, if you come across somebody intentionally or unintentionally that's in the residence. Um, and, and, you know, in, in our discussions, Dave, you had also said to me, you know, sometimes there's, you know, does my intention matter? Cause I wasn't intending to break into somebody's home, but you also can't be ignorant of the law and say, well, I didn't realize it was a crime to do X, Y, Z. Um, that doesn't, that's not going to kind of uh, get you out of trouble necessarily if, you know, it may seem like an abandoned property, um, but somebody is, is around there and that's their residence and that's their property regardless of, you know, there's, there's a lot of different factors that can play into the potential outcome. The other thing though, aside, these are kind of like, we've kind of briefly touched on the sentencing. If you're convicted, right. You can look at anywhere from probation to jail time and kind of lots of, things in between. Um, but if you run a trial and the Crown's not able to prove the essential elements of the offense beyond a reasonable doubt, then you could be acquitted entirely. Right. But which means that you have no criminal record from it. However, if you run your trial, you also are subject to your release conditions and your um in the meantime, and it can in some jurisdictions, for example in Hamilton, um, it can take you over a year to schedule a trial date. So in different jurisdictions are different. Milton's different. You know, I think, uh, you know, Toronto, even different courthouses within Toronto will be different from one another as far as availability of dates and uh, that sort of thing, too. So and then there's other issues. There's other arguments that can be made, for example, if the police, um, you know, mishandled your case, if if there's what we call charter issues. So if you weren't given the opportunity to speak to a lawyer, if um you know, if there was any excessive use of force, if there was um, excessive delay in getting your case to trial through no fault of the accused person, then there could also be charter remedies um, that can come into play as well. So oh, lots of stuff to consider. Um, yeah. So maybe you can answer this one, maybe not. But because, you know, amongst my peers, we talk a lot about trespassing. We don't really focus on breaking and entering. Um, but under, mm -hmm. uh, to your knowledge, under what circumstances would a uh, trespassing become a criminal charge? Right. So I think it goes back to kind of what we were talking about with discretion, right? Like where yeah. the police, if the police have a complainant or so the so complainant is the, the person that's c contacted the police and said, I'm concerned that someone's at my property or my, my great aunt's property or whoever it is, right? Um, the neighbor complains. If you have a Karen on the phone that says, you know, makes a bunch of allegations. Oh, I saw this group of, you know, masked men that went into this property and it looked like they had guns on them and they left with a bunch of stuff and they were causing all this commotion and caused all this damage. Like, even if, whether that's true or not, if that's what a witness has disclosed and there's some evidence of that, um, obviously that would rise to the, to a criminal threshold, but, and I know in your circumstance, it was kind of surprising that, uh, that this would lead a police officer to actually criminally charge you. Um, so it can be a number of, it's, it goes back to their discretion and whether like the police have a lot of discretion in determining 
whether it's at that threshold. And again, then it moves on to the Crown who have the discretion to determine whether there's a reasonable prospect of conviction in the circumstances. Okay, mm-hmm. so we talked a little bit earlier about intent. And so if I approach an abandoned property with no intentions of committing a crime, no intentions of stealing, no intentions of causing any damage, uh, would this help me? Or does it just depend on the situation? Yeah, so the lawyer answer will always be it depends. Um, yeah. So as far as your intention, um, so... Okay, let's let's use an example of where if somebody said to you, I need you to go out to my farm property and get my, uh, you know, my tackle box. I have this special fishing box. I need you to go get it from this property. And they gave you the address and you go to the property and you go in and you, you're found there. There's someone else there. This is what the heck are you doing? You're stealing my tackle box. You had no intention to take something or to be at a property that you weren't authorized to be at. Right. So in that circumstance, it would be difficult. Like if you had to, you know, if you were criminally charged and you did go to trial, you would may have to provide evidence. If the crown has a good, strong case, otherwise you may have to provide evidence that, look, I was told I was authorized to attend this property. I had no, I had no reason to think that I was committing a crime. I just went to go get my uncle Joe's tackle box. (laughs) Yeah. Right. That's that. There's no intention there. But if you're like, well, I know I might get in trouble for this, but I don't intend to hurt anybody. That's, that's, there's still some, there's still a little bit of intention there, right? There's still an intention to be at the property that you know, that you know, there, you may not be allowed to be at my, I'm not going to give any advice. I mean, but as far as I wouldn't, I wouldn't encourage people to be exploring in given the risks involved with potentially being charged with a crime and the, the implications that that can have for you. So in my situation, we talked about the term dwelling house and, you know, you and I had debated the fact that, you know, no one dwells in this house. So why am I being charged with uh, entering a dwelling? Um, So how does this come into play? You know, whether it's in my situation or or whatever, how does, how does this, like, what is that? What is a dwelling house? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think, um, you know, and actually I can look up the, the legal definition for you. I think it's actually defined right in the criminal code. I could be wrong, but um, essentially it's going to de- like, it's going to come down to if you get to a trial, like a, does the police determine that this is potentially a dwelling house? That's when you get charged. B, do the crowns believe that like, are they going to pursue this and try to argue that this, there is a dwelling house and then it moves on to a judge. And is a judge going to say, well, okay, this house has been sitting there dilapidated. It's known in the community. Everyone goes there and no one's ever cared before. Like that's yeah. the other thing too, right? If, if there's evidence about this being a semi-public space, so to speak, right? Like we all know that, you know, Farmer France is somewhere that like kids go and hang out and no one cares. Like no one intervenes mm-hmm. with that. That's going to yeah. be relevant. Um, if the people moved out of their house a month ago and they're in the middle of a move and there just happens to be no one there, that's, I think that would still fall in the definition of a dwelling house. So I think it's going to be all fact-based and maybe there's a house, for example, where people go to Florida for half the year. There Are they dwelling yeah. in the house during those six months of the year when they're hanging out on the beach down there and leaving their house in Burlington or you know, or Ajax or whatever empty, Mm -hmm. like it's still their dwelling house, even if they're not in it at that time. Right. So there, it's going to be very, and that's the, the, the situation with any kind of fact pattern that you're dealing with in criminal law is that it's going to be fact based. Right. Um, and I mean, we're only talking about houses and I mean, I won't, I won't get into this, but I mean, there's, you know, abandoned or vacant prisons there's hospitals Mm -hmm. there's factories and i mean i'm sure that's those are all individual episodes on their own (laughs) to talk about what happens if i'm caught after the fact or in the moment in a prison or or in a hospital but anyways we won't get into that um so i guess what i wanted to wrap it up as is as a criminal defense lawyer how would you be able to help any urban explorer with any of the plethora of potential charges that we uh that we mm-hmm. make, might face, like would would we say that uh, you know Megan Smith Law would be a, <laughs> uh, 
a great resource to go to if we are charged with anything under the potential yeah, things that we can be charged uh, with. Absolutely. Like I had said, like, I'm not going to exaggerate that, you know, I would say if it's going to be on the more serious spectrum where there's talking about home invasions and significant yeah. violence and those types of allegations, then I would probably refer you to a, a colleague of mine. But when we're talking about, um, you know, on the, on the less significant spectrum allegations of, you know, mischief, as you mentioned, or, you know, where there's no, there was no one home when this happened, no one was confronted, you know, you know, those types of things, what I would, my approach is going to be to kind of assist people in walking through the criminal process, requesting disclosure, making sure that we're not missing anything from that, trying to negotiate a resolution with the crown if possible. And at the end of the day, if there's tribal issues, I'm more than happy to support people going through that process and say, let's go to trial. Or if there's charter issues, as we talked about, if the police, um, you know, have made any mistakes or if there's delay in the case and there's certain charter issues that we can raise um, and kind of just walking through that process. A lot of people think on their first appearance when they get a court date from that officer, they think, okay, I'm going to go to court and I'm going to have my trial. Everybody, so many people think that. And that's just not how it works. You kind of have to go through the motions of different court appearances to, sh- to keep the court up to date on what's been happening, how it, what's happening. Have you had a chance to speak with the Crown? You're not even going to get schedule your trial until you have that conversation with the Crown about what are the issues going to, what are the time estimates for trial? And is, is there any potential to resolve this? And I like to get creative and I loved your suggestion and the Crown thought it was a great idea as well. Um to resolve things on a more kind of like in a holistic sense, I guess you could say in a restorative justice. I think those, I think that's a much more meaningful approach. Um, but at the same time, sometimes the crown takes unreasonable positions or the police or the, and you have to schedule a trial and move the matter forward. So that's also yeah. something that's available if it's needed. Yeah, so I, I think I definitely got lucky. And when the summons came in the mail, I, you know, I I did start doing my research, and I, you know, I looked into it, and I considered, you know, all right, uh, what am I looking at here? Can I do this on my own? And this was also during COVID, so I wasn't even able to go to a courthouse and have someone help me there. Um, I was lost, and uh, you were a, a saint. You were a, you were such a huge <laughs> help you. to me to get to take care of this, and. Um, and I just decided, you know, I'm going to bite the bullet. I'm going to pay the fee. I'm going to get somebody who knows what they're doing instead of trying to rely on myself. Um, and then where else you you gave a huge bit, bit of advice was after the fact, because I had to go in for identification. And, you know, the fingerprints, they had to, they had to document all my tattoos, the mug shots and everything. And I said to you, mm-hmm. so I still have my identification on record. What happens now? And your advice to me was to send a, lo- uh, a letter to the police department where I went and ask them to remove my identification from the system. I believe that's what you told me to do. And I did that and I never got a response. So I never knew if they actually did or not, because mm-hmm. I like to go over the border <laughs> and I don't want to have to cross the border and have, and have this come up. So I did a test run and <laughs> I went over to, to Detroit by myself to see if I would be asked about anything or if anything came up. And no problem. I got over, <laughs> no questions asked. Well, and I've been over the border three times since. And you have no convictions on your record, which is, should be what matters. But I've crossed the border where they said, have you ever been charged criminally? Right. Um, are you subject to any charges right now? And I sometimes discourage people from traveling when they have outstanding charges, not because they're not allowed to travel, but because you have to answer that honestly. Right. Um, and then they'll have a record that you, you know, have been charged. So. It's, it's, we don't have any, con- and that's another question that comes up for people is, am I going to be able to travel with a criminal record? Well, it's not yeah. up to me or the Canadian <laughs> courts. It's up to yeah. the, tr- the country that you're traveling to, to decide whether to let you in or not. And yeah. for some countries, um, you know, some of these offenses aren't considered that serious and others, they're a big deal. You know, yeah. sometimes, yeah. you know, theft under, for example, theft under $5,000, is something that's not considered to be the most serious offense in Canada. And other countries would take that very, you don't steal from people, right? Yeah. I mean, we take yeah. it seriously too, but other countries would take a 
a more strict approach. Um, so it, it's really dependent on that. Um, as far as destroying records, that's going to be ultimately at the discretion of the police as well. Yeah. And that yeah. there's always going to be a record out there. If you've been arrested, that will go into CPEC. Right. Um, so they'll, they'll know, but you also don't have a conviction and that's mm-hmm. what should really mm-hmm. matter is that the crown has not been able to, or decided not to pursue it for the public interest, not worth their, their energy. Either way, there's not been a finding of guilt. Good. Well, this has, I hope this has been uh, helpful for the listeners. You were definitely helpful for me. And I will say if any of my friends or listeners or, or peers are in, a, are in a pickle, I highly would recommend <laughs> Megan. It's msmithlaw.ca. Go check out her website if you are ever in a pickle like I was. Uh, and that's it. Megan, thank you so much for your valuable time. I really appreciate it. And uh, best of luck to you and uh, your business. Thanks so much, Dave, for having me. It's nice to connect again. Okay, guys, Urbex Book Club time once again. The book is Access All Areas, written in 2005 by Jeff Chapman, also known as Ninjalicious. He is a pioneer of the hobby as we know it today. And this book is like a Bible for urban explorers. There's a link in the description down below if you want to pick up a copy of this. If you're into urban exploring, I highly recommend you read it. Now, Jeff talks a lot about police and the laws. There's a lot of different things in here that I could be reading. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some snippets from uh, pages 71 and on. He talks a lot about the law, uh, run-ins with the police, and some of the things that you can be charged with. So this is starting on page 70 of Access All Areas. Here we go. If you're caught while exploring, you could potentially face some fairly serious punishments. If you're unlucky enough to be caught by an unfriendly cop, and sentenced by an unsympathetic judge. It's a good idea to familiarize yourself with your provincial or state laws and municipal bylaws regarding trespassing and related offenses. So you know what specific bizarre anti-trespassing laws are enforced in your area. Even assuming that you have taken nothing, damaged nothing, and neither harmed nor risked harm to anyone but yourself, some of the different things your local police may decide to try to charge you with include breaking and entering. Now, according to Jeff, breaking and entering is an utter joke of a name and that this crime requires no breaking, not even the breaking of a seal. Realistically, the crime should simply be called entering since it requires only the most minor application of pressure. Even if you just gently blow on an unlocked and slightly ajar door to permit entry to a site, you can technically be charged with breaking and entering. Any judge that would actually charge you with this would obviously be doing so in utter disregard for the spirit of the law, which is clearly intended to punish people for forced entry. But that's not to say it wouldn't happen. Burglary. Burglary is very similar to breaking and entering, except that the person who does the entering must be deemed to have done so in the hopes of stealing or committing some other crime. And the charges normally only apply to situations involving active buildings. Mischief. Mischief is a sort of a grab bag crime, a miscellaneous category, just in case someone does something naughty that the powers that be forgot to outlaw. In many situations where the powers that be feel that punishing you with the trespassing alone isn't serious enough, they may figure out a way to tack on an additional charge of mischief, rather than the more traditional assorted wrongdoing and mucking about. He goes on and talks about things like possession of burglar's tools, and he also talks about Uh, trespassing charges on their own. I'm not going to read all that. I don't want to bore you guys, but I highly recommend once again, guys, get the book, access all areas, read the whole thing. I've read it four times. Page 70 is where he talks a lot about the different things that you can be charged with. Uh, And that's about it guys. So that's it. Episode 10. Thanks a lot for watching. Thanks for listening. If you're listening on Apple podcasts, please do me a favor, guys, leave me a review. Let us know how you like my podcast. And if it's doing well for you, if you're enjoying it, guys, next week is a really good one. Speaking of the lawyer who we talked to today, we talked about the day that I was charged, things that I did to get that charge. Well, next week, we're going to talk to a woman named Louise. Louise is the lady who charged me and we're going to have a talk with her. Uh, We're going to talk about what happened, my situation, how it made her feel, why she felt the need to press charges against me, how I resolved it, and how she felt about the resolution. It's also a great opportunity to hear what it's like from the perspective of the property owner. And you guys are going to really like, I think, what she has to say. So that's it, guys. Thanks a lot. Episode 10. 
now in the books. See you guys next week. Peace.